Hi guys, this is Luca from Brainy. We've been receiving a lot of questions about the CFA certificate in ESG investing lately. Um, in short, the CFA ESG, you know, what is it? <clears throat> Who is it for? Uh, what, does it, what does it entail in terms of uh, preparation? So we thought we would just create a short video, which hopefully will give you a little bit of an overview and uh, then you can better assess whether it is something for you or not. So just in general, TXM was launched in 2019 by the CFA UK Society, was ta then taken over by the CFA Institute and rolled out globally in Sept September 2021, which means that since September 2021, everybody who chooses to do it can do it. And importantly there, um, you do not need to have a CFA charter in order to do the CFA ESG. These are two different things. You do, you do not have to have uh, done the CFA level one, two or three um, to do the CFA ESG. CFA ESG, everybody can do it. <clears throat> then in terms of workload, we estimated it takes roughly 100 to 130 hours to prepare. This equates to roughly one and a half to two months of preparation time. Uh, the exam itself consists of 100 questions that need to be taken within 140 minutes. And the questions can either be a single line question or a small case. Now, since you have found this video, we're just going to assume that you know about sustainable investing. You've heard about the term ESG. You may have um, get some sense of the importance of this um, huge mega trend that has been unfolding uh, over the last 20 years, obviously highly affecting the wealth management industry with new clients, younger clients demanding much more um, value driven investment solutions. They want their investments to be in line with their own values. And this is highly relevant because the biggest uh, transfer of wealth is happening as we speak from the baby boomer generation to the millennial generation, which is very aware of uh, social issues and, and, susta and sustainable issues like climate change. And <clears throat> a second industry that's highly impacted obviously is the asset management industry. Here, these charts show, show, just show you how how much of a commitment that the asset management industry is making towards ESG research, uh, climate research, and also creating or repurposing strategies to make them mo much more sustainable, uh, as, can, <clears throat> as can be seen in the second chart. But then the question is, what is ESG? What is sustainability? And ESG, sustainable investing, is really it really serves a little bit like an umbrella term that encompasses a lot of concepts, a lot of terms, a lot of definitions. Think of things like UNPRI, SDGs, Net Zero Paris Agreement, impact, stewardship, um, you know, many, many different concepts, regulations, uh, ideas, um, you know, ways to invest, which all fall under this umbrella term ESG, but they all have their distinct meaning. Um, all these concepts have a very um, significant and specific purpose. So the CFA ESG was really designed to help you understand and create a little bit of a framework in how to think about these different concepts, right? <clears throat> so just uh, what, you, what you can see here on this slide is, um, are all the chapters in the CFA ESG. And, and bef before I'm going to run you through which each of these chapters more or less talks about, uh, just for you to understand, again, you do not need to have a CFA. Um, and the, 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 the exam is designed in a way that teaches you about the terminologies, definitions and concepts much more than it is a mathematical um, exam. So calculations are going to be um, are not going to be asked, or very few uh, calculations going to be asked. It's, it's much more understanding the concepts. This is important because if you're if you're um, worried that it's going to be like the CFA, which is very calculation heavy, it is not. It is not. It's really more about understanding what is ESG, this umbrella term, unpacking and demystifying all the different concepts. So <clears throat> introduction to ESG gives a high level, uh, which is chapter one, gives a high level uh, explanation of ESG. You know, how does it fall into, into the fiduciary duty? Um, you know, what is responsible investing? How has it been uh, um, 
how has it been uh, uh, um, used ESG this ESG term how has it been used uh, within the different with the, within different um, market participants you know what is what, what are exclusions what are what is ESG integration and so on so it really speaks a little bit about broadly what is ESG then e the ESG market goes one step further and <clears throat> a gives you a little bit of the history of how some of the policies that we know today have uh, have come to be you know what say um, what report um, or or what what uh, analysis or research has led to some of the of the concepts that we know today uh, it speaks to the to the <clears throat> market participants in ESG which are pension funds asset managers policy makers you know what has been at the forefront there um, then the environmental factors kind of speaks for itself obviously touches on all the um, issues that are related to to and you know to all the envir environmental issues um, so basically lays them down um, on the lay, lays them down based on the planetary boundaries and these are things like air pollution uh, biodiversity loss um, um, <clears throat> uh, land ma um, land conversion uh, fresh water withdrawals kind of the, 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 these are the anchor the anchor issues that we have today with with the environment and then basically it helps you it, the, the e factor looks at what are the risks um, that each of the companies may either contributing to or be uh, subjected to these risks um, these issues um, obviously talks about climate mit mitigation climate climate adaptation what is the blue economy what is circular economy um, carbon pricing um, all of these kind of um, terms you will learn in in this uh, chapter and then the social factors um, again kind of a little bit self-explanatory but if you look um, <clears throat> one layer down it is um, talks about the social mega trends that we all know automation artificial intelligence uh, globalization wealth inequality and and, and income inequality um, digital disrup disruption social media all these um, mega trends that cannot be stopped because these are part of technological innovation may lead to social issues down the line right <clears throat> wealth inequality increasing or um, you know think about social media with with um, how 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 politicizing um, issues are being and how dividing this uh, this can be between the two political fronts things like that are touched in this but then also human rights labor rights things like modern slavery <clears throat> All of these issues are talked in, in chapter four, social factors. Governance, this has to do uh, with how a company is run um, and governed. Um, so every company has to have a board of directors. It talks about the differences between the board of directors in the US and, and in Europe, um, <clears throat> what, what, what sensible standards are for um, how to compose a board of director cannot be too tight with management because the board of director is, um, you know, they have the agency to to look after the shareholders and stakeholders' interests. All right, so they cannot be they be, cannot be too um, you know too closely aligned with management in a way that management can behave you know in, in an uh, unethical way and they would allow it so <clears throat> talks a little bit about of that uh, about that and also gives a little bit of a history of why why we have these standards today because there had been huge scandals with uh, uh, with, with corporations in the past um, that involved bribery or <clears throat> falsification of documents and, and stuff like that accounting um, accounting fraud which which then have led to the creation of standards in how a company has to be governed <clears throat> and overseen so this is um, governance factors then <clears throat> engagement and stewardship 
So stewardship means uh, the active, uh, being an active and involved owner. And engagement means we as owners, and in many cases, it's the asset managers that we employ to manage our money who act as the um, <clears throat> engagers with the companies. They should bring ESG issues to the management when they speak with management. They invest it on our behalf and they should bring up ESG issues. So it talks about this concept of engaging with a company rather than just disinvesting. They try to say, hey, we've identified this issue. What are you doing about this? Can you please disclose more? Can we find a way to fix this? What is your plan for that? This is engaging with the company. <clears throat> So you learn all about the, the stewardship code, um, ways to engage, you know, rather top down or, uh, or if you do fundamental research from a bottom up, then if we move on to chapter seven, and this is probably one of the heavier, um, one of the heavier chapters, ESG analysis, valuation, integration. So your view here is from the view of an investment analyst. And I want to emphasize again, you do not need to calculate. It's more about understanding. You want to know if you analyze a company and you identify ESG issues, how do you, uh, how do you integrate that into your valuation of that company? If you're a fundamental research analyst for a stock or for a bond, you want to know about all the risks. You want to know about financial ratios. You want to be, you, you want to know, you know, um, your forecasted uh, growth numbers, all of these things, these all filter into your valuation model. ESG is another set of factors that you can integrate in your ESG analysis. So it talks about this and it talks about it on a company level so or, or, a, sing, or, or a bond level. So you have um, the, all the different asset classes are looked at here, uh, bonds, equities, um, <clears throat> looks about you know looks looks at it from a qualitative perspective from a quantitative perspective, and then it also talks about the data that that is available, um, the the research that can be conducted, then how how to do it how to value it how to value these kind of fat risk factors within your valuation model, and then how to construct a portfolio. <clears throat> if we then move on to chapter eight which is ESG integrated portfolio construction management. We go one step above the company level um, analysis and look at the portfolio as a whole, right? Here, what's, what's um, the concepts that are described here would be how to shift your strategic asset allocation or your tactical asset, uh, asset allocation. So this, is, this, this uh, involves the whole portfolio, um, how to shift it to be more ESG uh, aware or, or have a higher ESG score. So it talks about scores, um, <clears throat> talks about scenario analysis. It talks about integrating ESG from a, for a manager uh, selection. So if you are a manager selector at a pension fund or, in, or a private bank, <clears throat> you wanna know how does the asset manager um, integrate um, ESG and how do you integrate ESG in your ma manager selection process. Um, then exclusions is another topic that is that is discussed in this topic here. Um, exclusions obviously a huge part of sustainable investing. Um, there's positive screening, there's negative screening. Um, so these are the, the concepts that are described in this. And also again, uh, for the different asset classes. So you, equity is discussed here, fixed income, real estate, hedge funds, and so on. And then lastly, the last chapter, investment mandates, portfolio analytics, and client reporting. Um, so this basically looks at the after the fact of ESG investing. How is it, you know, what, what kind of reporting can be expected if you're, in, if you're a client, um, you know, how to analyze whether ESG has been conducted in a, in a, in a sensible manner. Uh, what are the investment mandates that you give? What do you have to consider when you give an investment mandates? What are your objectives? Um, so basically looks again, <clears throat> looks at it from the perspective of a 
of a of a client of an institutional client or a pension fund um that basically ha what what can i expect from my asset manager uh, in terms of analytics um how should i challenge him on esg issues um i see that here he, he bought a, a company that has a poor esg score why why did you do that what is this so basically this is the perspective that you have to take from uh, chapter 9 so <clears throat> this this basically sums up in in you know in a nutshell um the the entire cfa esg exam um, then hopefully this is helpful for you to better understand is this something that you wanna that you wanna learn if um, if you choose to do so um, the question then is okay how do you prepare for it and <clears throat> we have this um, preparation process that um, that you know our customers have uh, have used and we we ourselves have, have used and basically it starts with you have to read the curriculum. There is no way around that. You have to read the 500 pages. It's only 500 pages. I mean, think about it. It's just one exam. Um, you have to go through this. Um, there is no way around this. But once you've read it, <clears throat> you understand all the concepts. You will have heard so many different terms that sound similar and describe similar topics, but are different. They are slightly different. They have different meaning. So how do you go about memorizing similar sounding concepts and, and, and distinguish them? You do this by step two, memorizing them. And how do you do that? You use a question bank. Now we at Brainy, we happen to have created one which has 500 questions per chapter. So it's, it's 500 question total. Um, <clears throat> think about, you know, maybe between 30 and, and 90 questions per chapter. And, and you get the answer key. So you re if, if you don't know the answer, once you have answered it, you will see the exact paragraph that talks about the, the, the question. So you, but no matter if you work with us or not, you will have to memorize, memorize the concepts because otherwise, you know, it's going to be hard for you to, to separate the different uh, ideas here. Then you, you do this and whenever you don't know something, you start taking notes. Okay. I didn't know, I didn't quite understand this concept. Um, go back, reread it in the curriculum or read it in, in, uh, in summary notes. If you have some, again, with, with Brainy, you will get, you know, summary notes that basically distill the, the 500 pages into 25 pages. Doesn't mean you don't have to read the curriculum first, read it first, but after that, you, you may use just the, the 25 pages and add your notes there. Repeat the process, keep doing it. Um, until you feel comfortable enough to say, okay, I'm going to take a mock exam. Brainy offers two mock exams, which include also case studies <clears throat> and, um, which, which case studies, which, which very closely mimic your experience that you would take at the CFA ESG actual exam. Do these two, two mock exams again, review them, uh, reassess them, go read, uh, whatever, whatever, um, chapter you didn't know. Um, add to your notes and then keep rereading your notes. After you take these two mock exams, you should be ready enough to take the CFA mock exam. That's the one that the CFA provides. Um, <clears throat> see how you're faring there. If you feel comfortable enough, obviously review it. And then if you feel comfortable enough, you go ahead and take the exam. So this is, um, this has been, um, this, uh, this short video which we hope gives you a little bit of a background of the CFA ESG. Obviously, um, uh, we wish you uh, good luck. We, we very welcome your feedback, your comments. Uh, and if you have any question, here are the details to reach us. And uh, good luck with your study preparation.